Okay, welcome back. I hope everyone had a chance to get a break and get a chance to stretch your legs or get a snack or something. Um, but it is 1130 Pacific time. So let's go ahead and get started. Our next speaker of the day is Dr. Christina Zampatella. Dr. Zampatella is a licensed clinical psychologist in both Delaware and California. She's a fellow of Thanatology, which is a death loss and grief specialist certification awarded by the, the Association for Death Education and Counseling. She's the founder of the Center for Grief and Trauma Therapy, co-owner and director of clinical services at Integrative Psychology Group, a professor and faculty member, and a professional speaker. She works as an adjunct faculty member at Marion University's Master in Thanatology program and Goldley Beacom College, focusing her research, course development, and teaching on bereavement studies and integrative psychology. She served as the chair for the Continuing Education Committee for the San Diego Psychological Association, as well as the Delaware Psychological Association. Dr. Zampatella specializes in death, loss, and bereavement, integrative psychology, spirituality, and nature-based therapy. She's the former resident psychologist on Fox 5 News in San Diego, and is often featured on NBC News in Philadelphia. She has been featured in Elle Magazine, BuzzFeed, and the Huffington Post. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Christina Zampatella. Hello, everybody. I'm so thankful uh, to be invited back to the Scleroderma um, uh, conference. I've done this a couple of times, and it's, it, I'm, I'm honored to have been asked to be here again, and I'm excited to be able to share a different topic this time, um, but nonetheless a very, very important one, as I am uh, very aware that uh, we often uh, have our, um, our, our grief associated with chronic and terminal illness completely overlooked. And so I'm looking forward to teaching you a little bit more about disenfranchised grief and learning a little bit about how this might be impacting your life. So I'm just gonna jump right into it because we have an hour today. I wanna make sure we have time for question and answer, um, but just to let you see where we're headed today, um, we are going to be starting here at uh, talking about types of losses and the def definition of loss actually. Um, because often we talk about death, but we forget that there are so many different kinds of losses that are actually very grievable. We're um, then going to talk about the different kinds of categories of disenfranchised loss after I have a chance to define what that is for you. And then we're going to look at how we can disenfranchise ourselves, how other people might do that, and how that happens on a cultural level as well. We'll then talking about the three kinds of failures that lead to disenfranchised grief, which is empathetic failure, ethical failure, and political failure. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about behaviors and consequences, meaning ways disenfranchisement is expressed uh, for ourselves and to ourselves, and what, how that impacts what the grieving process is. Now, I can really go a very um, uh, scenic route on this topic because there's so much to share. So I'm gonna do my best to rein in my South Philly Italian girl and get her to stay focused without going too far off track because there's, um, there's a lot of things that tie into even understanding you know, what does grief look like because it's not the five stages of grief. Um, but again, I digress and I'm gonna get myself back on track here. So, and then what do we do? Okay, you're gonna learn all about this, but how can we reduce disenfranchisement? So that's the plan for today as we move forward in our presentation. So first of all, what exactly is grievable? What is a loss? Well, in defining that, we experience a sense of loss when someone or something very dear to us has been taken from our lives. And that leaves a sense of emptiness, a sense of deprivation. Something is missing. And that can be anything from uh, and anything that is near and dear to us, including our health. So it's an experience of our own human condition, right? So all of us experience grief but we experience different kinds of losses throughout our lives. Again, it could be, uh, I'm gonna give a list of different kinds of losses that often we are faced with as we move forward in our lives. Um, and here's just some examples. By no means is this an exhaustive list. This is just some of the most common ones and you're, you're probably gonna be able to recognize some of these that you've experienced yourself. When we talk about death, often immediately what comes to us is family members, of course, and friends. Uh, parent, grandparent, sibling, child, pet. My dog and my cat are my favorite people in this house. I live with four other people, but they just happen to be my favorite. They talk back a lot less. <laughs> and my three stepsons are also known as the Delaware Wrecking Crew, and that's who I live with. And uh, they can be a handful sometimes, but um, 
but we often overlook the importance of pets in our emotional and psychological well-being and our spiritual well-being. And, uh, you know, we'll hear things like, oh, you know what, well, you can always get another dog. I cannot get that dog. I want that dog back. So um, pet is often overlooked as being a grievable loss. Um, marriages and partnerships, friends, and that's not just to death, but friends and friendships that we might have, um, especially if we're faced with uh, friends who don't understand what's going on for us and we feel that we want to pull away from those friendships and in that re and in that way we are pulled away from our support system previous levels of functioning i think a lot of you can relate to this um, you know as we move forward in our lives or move forward in our uh, the struggles that we have physically the previous levels of functioning that perhaps were uh, a, a little bit easier um, and we, we have to uh, figure out how we're going to adapt to those losses, not only physically, but emotionally, psychologically, and, um, and spiritually. Also our health. Um, I know that when I was uh, 21 years old, I was diagnosed with epilepsy. Epilepsy is a very uh, uh, unseen disorder. Um, it's uh, also life-threatening, um, but you wouldn't know by looking at me, right? And so we carry that grief of our health being lost because now my life has completely changed. The things I can do, the things I cannot do, the limitations that have come as a result. And I've grieved all of these things along the way. And as life you know, proceeds forward, you start thinking about, well, how else is this going to be impacting my life? And what kinds of losses am I going to have as a result of that? Uh, jobs, we're certainly with COVID right now, experiencing a lot of losses around jobs. Uh, retirement, we make a lot of assumptions that retirement's going to be exciting and we're going to have all this time. But we may have spent a whole lot of time in many, many years with a group of people that we've seen, you know, five days a week. And as a result of that, are being forced into retirement, being forced to have to leave work. You know, we have an identity tied up into, well, you know, Hey, my name is Christina. Who are you? Oh, I'm, you know, I'm Jessica. Great. Where are you from? What do you do for a living? There's a sense of identity tied up, especially in our culture with what we do for a living. And if we end up losing our job or having to leave work and we have to go on to disability or whatever changes may occur as a result of that, we, it, we that often is overlooked as, wow, okay, so what, how has my identity shifted? if I'm not going to be in that position any longer? And how is that going to impact the way I understand myself in the world? Because the world as I knew it has shattered. It's just, it's not the same as it was before and I'm not gonna be able to go back. So what does that mean for me in trying to adapt to that loss and weaving that loss into the story of my life? Um, we over, uh, overlook also incarceration. I wrote health here twice. I don't know what happened there. So excuse me for, you have any idea how many times I look at these slides and I'm like, oh, I got it. There's no, no typos. There's always typos, always typos. Um, some additional losses that we often overlook are um, a sense of independence. Uh, sometimes when our health is impacted, as we know, or as we get older, um, our ability to do things for ourselves sometimes is pulled away from us, either because we can't physically do that or we're getting to a place cognitively we're unable to do so. And there is grief along the way of that. Um, you know, perhaps you're no longer driving, as an example, or you're unable to take care of your, your health on your own. And there are adjustments that have to occur, and there, there is grief associated with that as well. But these are overlooked, right? We don't really see them as grievable. We just see them as painful. Um, abuse, a connection with one's spirituality or religious community, two separate things. Spirituality is how we connect to whatever is greater than ourselves, whether or not it's a higher power as in God or whatever, or it's a rock and that's how you feel connected to the world. That doesn't matter. It's how you find meaning and purpose in your life um, and or one's religious community where religion is a set of dogmatic beliefs, a group of people ascribed to to teach us many things like community and values and um, priorities in our lives and bringing a sense of solace we that gets challenged a lot of times when we have losses not always some people get closer but sometimes we start to challenge and feel angry with our higher power and as a result there's a rift between ourselves and our connection to that spiritual self earlier identities so for example you know leaving 
um, adolescence and launching out into the world. And now you're a young adult and you're supposed to figure out how to do your own laundry. Yep, earlier identities, maybe you're, you're grieving that as well. These potential futures, this is a huge one. Anytime we have a loss, all of those futures we told ourselves that we may have had access to, those may not be available to us any longer. And you grieve that which you had not even moved into yet. You change the stories that you may have you know, been telling yourself. And they can be very sad to lose those. It can be heart-wrenching and infuriating as well. A sense of safety, I think we're going through right that right now with COVID. Um, the, the, I don't know about you, but I remember when it first started and people were running around with masks and I felt so overwhelmed uh, by the fact that, um, I mean, just by walking around, I didn't necessarily feel safe. Um, sense of self-efficacy, being able to do for oneself effectively, a sense of innocence, self-image, body parts, and a sense of generativity of what we are leaving behind greater than ourselves. So I wonder as you guys look at this, if you can identify or recognize the different losses that you may be experiencing or have experienced in your life and how have you adjusted to those losses? And if you haven't adjusted to those losses, what's going on? What's keeping you from being able to do that? So again, that's just a, an overview. I wanted to be clear that we're not just talking about uh, grief over the loss of a, of, a, of a person. So, okay, so when you're talking about this, you're like, hey, we're talking about disenfranchised grief. What the heck is that? Well, disenfranchisement is defined as being denied the right to grieve, the social support essential to overcoming their loss and deprived of the social validation in order to heal. Now, look, when we grieve, there is no getting over it. There is no resolution of grief. We grieve throughout our lives. We go, hopefully, from being in pain with our grief to having our pain. We carry those wounds, and that's normal. And <clears throat> excuse me. And anybody who tells you, you know what, you really got to move on in your life, you know, that he or she would have wanted you to do that, or, you know, you, you have to look forward for the positives in your lives. That, that's not necessarily true. Moving Moving on is one thing. That can make us feel like we're leaving something behind or we're wrong for bringing with us the continued pain of loss. It's more about moving forward and how do we live with that loss? How do we live with that grief? And how does it change from being very, very intense to being something that we carry that doesn't overtake us and that we've been able to adapt to? So there's a, a further explanation of this is it goes beyond the situation of mere awareness of grief to suggest a more or less active process of disavow, renunciation, and rejection. So this isn't always just something that seems to be happening around us. Sometimes we are flat out disenfranchised. And I'm going to give you some examples of that after we talk about the uh, five different kinds of categories of disenfranchised grief. So this is a general, you know, we're going to find different losses fall into multiple categories, and that's fine. Um, some of them have what we would call privilege. You would find them a little bit more strong in that category. But let's talk a little bit about these five categories of grief, of uh, disenfranchised grief. So first, the, the significance of a relationship is rejected, minimized, or not even recognized. So we would find people um, from the LGBTQ population perhaps falls here. Um, ex-spouses, uh, step-parents, um, uh, a, a, a person who, who has miscarried and so that that loss is not recognized as actually being a loss from a parental point of view. And so these things are minimized. I mean, even if in our friendships, right? Um, these relationships are not even recognized as being uh, an important enough relationship where somebody would say to you, go, how are you doing with that? So this is more about relationship loss. The second category is that the loss is not recognized because it's non-human, abstract, or inanimate. Health falls here. The loss of pets falls here. Homes, jobs, a sense of safety, um, our, our sense of, uh, uh, of community, our, our sense of identity. These losses that are so quiet, they're so subtle, um, because they're not identified as being that which is grievable, and it certainly is grievable. And when we don't have that recognition, we don't have the social support that we need, and we begin to question, should I even be grieving this? And then we minimize our own grief, which we'll get to here in just a second. 
the griever is not recognized as being capable of forming significant relationships or even recognizing the loss. So you find children in this category. We remake assumptions that they do not grieve because they don't grieve like adults grieve, or they don't understand what passing or death is uh, the way an adult does, but they do. They grieve at a uh, level that is based on their cognitive development. And so because we don't see it in the same way, we often don't even attend to the fact that children grieve. Um, people who are on the uh, autism spectrum, people who are um, have challenges intellectually, people who have cognitive impairments such as, such as uh, dementia, we make a lot of assumptions that those individuals do not grieve and so we do not attend to recognizing their grief. Another one is the circumstance of the death or the loss was stigmatized. So the reason why I got into grief um, as a specialty is in 1999, my brother on Christmas day died and he was 22 years of age and he died from a drug overdose. And uh, the things that were said to me when people did find out that how he died were, some of them were just astounding, just astounding. And so what we find is that people will shut down around sharing with people their grief when it's stigmatized. So things like suicide, homicide, AIDS, cancer, uh, even COVID is starting to become stigmatized because there's assumptions that are being made. And so what we do is we shut down in sharing it and we find ourselves grieving privately. And then the fifth category is that the grieving style is unacceptable. You often see this when we're comparing, um, for example, men and women or people who are uh, expressive with their grief or they're more introverted with their grief and there's confusion about well you know what you can't be that sad you're not crying well you don't have to cry in order to some people cry some people grieve more privately and you see this in families a lot when there's a disconnect between the grieving styles where maybe we have some people who dive into experiencing and expressing their grieving process and we find that they're able to openly communicate it and then you have other people who may go and tinker in the garage or, you know, quietly write in their journals. And there is a, a, a not an understanding or a recognition of the level of grief and the intensity of the grief that's occurring as a result of that. And so there ends up being conflict in the family on top or, or relationships on top of the fact that it is um, it's a very painful experience already. And if I had everybody in front of me right now, I would be stopping and saying, okay, anybody recognizing anything going on here? But one thing I do see is pets, which I'm very happy about right now because I have my husband. I love it. I love your cat. I have Vito. He would come in here. He thinks he's in charge of all of my presentations, but I had some support today to keep, uh, keep the, the fur children away. So what I'm talking about here about a whole bunch of what other people can do to disenfranchise um, our, us, but also we will disenfranchise ourselves, which is mind boggling, but of course we do, because if we don't have people who are recognizing that we have a right to grieve, then we question whether or not we have a right to grieve. So we call this um, auto oppression. I think it's a, it's a lack of self-compassion is what comes down to. But also there is like this, these rules that we are, have that were embedded in our culture and different culture have different grieving rules. As a result, because of our grieving rules here in the United States, we may not necessarily recognize what are the emotional indicators that I'm grieving. I'm feeling guilty, I'm feeling uh, angry, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling um, overwhelmed, I'm feeling relieved, that's a hard one. Often when we say, how are you feeling relieved if, for example, somebody has passed? Well, there's many reasons why you may, and then guilt comes right after that in a lot of cases. So the emotional indicators to even say, maybe I'm feeling this way because I am grieving, especially if you're not even identifying that you're grieving something. Other indicators would be like somatic indicators. And what that means is we take our pain and it comes out externally, which can exacerbate underlying conditions. Um, things like uh, migraines can start, irritable bowel syndrome, um, uh, headaches, um, flushness, a, uh, uh, ulcers. Our bodies speak our minds. Our bodies keep the score. And so if we're already struggling with some kind of medical uh, 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 disorder, then it can exacerbate that. 
And so attending to our grief attends to our physical well being as well. Some spiritual indicators as well, like maybe losing meaning, angry at uh, whatever one's higher power is, um, feeling lost, not having purpose in life, um, or also, like I said, feeling drawn closer to one's higher power. Behavioral indicators such as um, acting out behaviors, self-harm, uh, drug and alcohol use, um, perhaps uh, lashing out interpersonally would be some examples of behavioral inter, um, indicators, re withdrawal, um, refusal to engage in life, refusal to engage in our um, aspirational goals. Interpersonal indicators could be feeling very, very uh, uh, anxious interpersonally, the separation anxiety. Um, it could be pushing people away or lashing out at people. Um, we could be finding ways in which like we have these um, resentments and angers uh, within our relationships. And cognitive indicators, everything from difficulty with memory, difficulty with um, sequential processing. And what that means is what do I do first? What do I do second? What do I do third? When you're grieving, sometimes getting those things in, in line can be very challenging. Um, other cognitive indicators could be confusion, inability to focus, um, and, uh, and those kinds of uh, types of indicators as well. So normally at this point, again, I would have asked you some questions. We're going to hold questions towards the end of our presentation today. But I wanted to share with you that there are so many different ways that we can identify that we are grieving, but people don't teach us this. This isn't something when we, you know, when we go to school, we're still learning like these five stages of grief. Like I mentioned, those don't exist. And so if we're not following this like prescribed five stages, we're thinking that we're doing something wrong and we shut down ourselves even further. I must not be grieving correctly if I'm not feeling you know, uh, depressed or if I'm not feeling angry, which is completely untrue. So in talking about the different kinds of failures that lead to uh, disenfranchised grief, I really like this one, um, empathy. Man can no more survive psychologically in a psychological milieu that does not respond empathetically to him than he can survive physically in an atmosphere that contains no oxygen. There's a difference between sympathy and empathy. Empathy is when somebody is able to imagine what your internal world must feel like or could feel like and attempt to enter into that place to see if they can relate to that feeling. You will never hear me say, oh, you know, you, you, um, you, you lost your brother. I know exactly how you feel. I lost my brother too. I will never know exactly how you feel. Can I relate to some of those emotions? I bet I could, and I can be there for you and provide you the empathy that you need in order to heal. But when we are, it is, uh, when we are um, being disenfranchised, that is because the other person is not empathizing with us or our culture is not empathizing with us. It is not looking at us and saying, yes, your grief is valid. And so we run, that is one type of uh, failure. A second failure is an ethical failure. And this is when we have the, um, the failure to even understand that the person is feeling vulnerable and he or she is suffering. This is where we fail to respect another person. Perhaps we don't agree with the way that they're grieving and we fail to respect their grieving process. We fail to respect the fact that they are expressing it in their own unique way. So what does that do? Well, that hinders, inhibits, it interferes with, and it exacerbates our grieving process. It's already hard enough as it is. And now we're exacerbating it because we're not receiving this recognition that I am grieving and I'm grieving in my own way. Now we've got an enhancing of one's vulnerability and one's suffering. And yet we're, we're more alone now, or we think we're doing it wrong. So now it's all wrapped up together and it's becoming bigger and more disruptive. 
And then there's a political abuse of power. And this is rather disconcerting because when we are in situations in which we have uh, people of authority who are involved with our grieving process, our losses and decision-making power, um, if we are questioning our own awareness, our own knowledge, and we are deferring to another person, this can very much lead to disenfranchised grief. So one type of political abuse of power is what we call authority of expertise. This is when another person pretends to know or understand more than others when they do not. So the bereaved suffering or the efforts to heal. So th this is when we will say things like, um, I know that you're saying that you're, you know, you're feeling guilty, but you really shouldn't be feeling guilty because feeling guilty doesn't make any sense. You didn't do anything wrong. No, I, I'm feeling guilty. And you don't know because you weren't there. So pretending to know or understand more than other people when they do not is a form of a political abuse of power that leads to disenfranchisement. Assuming to have more knowledge um, is superior. So that would be an example. Like if you came to see me for therapy, and I would be like, okay, yeah, I understand your grief. You don't understand your grief, but I understand your grief because I'm a grief expert. I do not understand your grief any better than you. You know it better than me. I'm here to help you explore it. I'm here to help you acknowledge it, identify it, see how it's playing itself out in your life and, and uh, adapting to the losses. But I don't have more knowledge than you as a result of that. So when people come to you uh, assuming that they have more knowledge about something um, about your internal experience, that would be considered a political abuse of power when it comes to grief. Uh, the second category of the political abuse of power is authority of prerogative to choose. And what this means is the person has, uh, is pretending to have the responsibility to choose. So perhaps they're actually not in a position to make certain choices, for example, um, any kind of uh, after death um, uh, uh, types of rituals or you know, burials, uh, wills, executive, uh, you know, executive decisions. Um, when we have people who step into a position that they have no business being in because they're pre pretending to have that responsibility to choose. Um, when another person is deciding what's best for the bereaved, Oh, I know that you said that you really want to, you know, go home and rest, but really you need to get out and maybe you need to start dating again. Maybe I haven't even taken off my wedding rings yet. Maybe I haven't even done that. So it's not, it's not for another person to decide what's best for me, but some people will step into that role. And again, that's not always done in a way it's like trying to hurt another person, but it's taking away the recognition that that process is your process. Um, limiting options. So for example, you may want multiple uh, ways of being able to move forward with you know, goals in your life after there has been a loss or a change of some sort. But somebody comes in and says, yeah, you can't do that. You can't do that when perhaps you could, but this person who's trying to step into a position of power is limiting your options uh, before you even have a chance to step into those options. And controlling expressions, this for this, another example of this, I've kind of been mentioning this already today, but controlling expressions could be, you know, maybe you should stop crying, you'll feel better. These are things that I hear from my clients that other people have said to them. Um, and sometimes it's, again, it's not necessarily coming from a bad place. It's, I don't know how to make you feel any better. So I'm just going to say, Crying means somebody feels bad. So if I tell you to stop crying, maybe you'll stop feeling bad because I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help. And choosing how they adapt to a loss. And, and again, giving the example of, you know, hey, maybe you need to get back out there. Or, you know, if you start giving his clothes away, it might feel better that you're not uh, looking in, you know, in the closet and seeing his clothes there. And maybe that'll help. So examples of people who are um, moving into a position of decision-making when they don't have uh, the right to move into that position. I'll hold questions. I'm not used to not saying, anybody have any questions? And <laughs> leave it until the end there. So bear with me. It feels weird to just move into the next topic. All right, so we had those three different types of failures. So how are people uh, disenfranchised? They can. 
people can avoid contact altogether. You may have had somebody that was in your life and supportive and now they don't know what to do. So all of a sudden the calls, you know, stop coming. Um, they stop asking you to you go out. They make assumptions about what you're able to do and what you can't do. And so they um, may find that they don't know how to adjust to that and they completely stop uh, contacting you. Discouraging communication or expression of feelings. Um, that I gave you an example of, you know, um, you know, maybe if you stopped crying, you'll feel better. I remember I was uh, doing a presentation and a woman gave an example of when her mother had passed, she was sitting next to her grandmother and her, she was 10 years old and they were from a culture that was not very emotionally expressive. And she was sobbing. She had just lost her mom and her grandmother tapped her on the leg and said, honey, we don't cry in public. She's 10, she lost her mom. Of course you cry in public, right? But not in that culture. But in that case, she was disenfranchised. That was taking away the right for her to express her feelings the way she needed to. Give, giving unsolicited advice. Um, I gave you a couple examples of that already. So, you know, maybe you need to get out there. Hey, maybe you need to um, exercise more. Maybe that'll make you feel better. Maybe you should start meditating. That'll take it away. Could meditation be helpful? Yes, meditation could be helpful. I didn't ask you to tell me whether or not meditation was going to be helpful. Meditation could be, you know. Making rude or insensitive comments. Um, when my brother passed, I remember there was a woman who came up to me who I thought was what I thought was a, a safe friend, one that was, you know, empathetic, who said to me, well, maybe if Damien had gotten into uh, rehab earlier, and I'm thinking, maybe if I stab you in the neck with a fork, like that would make everything better. You've got to be kidding me. And, and people don't hear what they're going to say sometimes when they say things like that. And in some ways that can come out as being helpful. And then in other ways, it's just like the filter went off and they didn't even think about how that was going to impact how the other person was going to feel. Expressing inappropriate expectations about the person's grief responses. You know, it's been a year. It's been six months. You really, I mean, I don't know. You think something's wrong. You should talk to somebody because you really seem like you haven't really um, stopped grieving very much. That, that's not for another person to say. So these are examples in how people are disenfranchised and making decisions uh, without the permission or judge the grievers' decisions, which we've been talking about today. So what does this do to you? Well, it intensifies your grief reactions across the board and it's already hard enough, right? Any kind of ambivalence that might be in relationships or types of relationships such as abortions, ex-spouses, um, those kinds of unspeakable types of uh, relationships and any other crises that might be occurring as a result of the loss becomes exacerbated. The factors that facilitate grief might be excluded. So if you are pulled away and you are unable, you know, feeling like you have no right to grieve, whatever that is, if there are rituals that are associated, for example, with the loss of somebody um, or no ability to plan for the future because you're not being recognized as a person who would be involved with that planning, those things are excluded, which then again, create other crises and can exacerbate the grieving process even further. And here's the big one, no social support or you're alienating from other, alienated from other people, from one's culture, or even from parts of yourself. Without social support, one of the main things I talk with people about when, especially when I first meet them um, and they're in my office, I'm, I am looking at their social support, the quality of their social support and how they turn to their social support. We are clan members, we are not meant to be grieving alone. And that grieving remains private. And in that, we have no place to express our grief. And we carry that and we remain in pain, which eventually maybe could lead to what is something called prolonged grief disorder. And that's when grief does not find a place in our lives. That's when we are unable to find a place where we have um, adapted to the losses or accepted the full reality of that loss. It's almost like the loss just happened and yet it's a year, it's two years, it's 10 years later. And when people get into that prolonged grief 
uh, place. We need to uh, have the, the, the knowledge that it's time for us to reach out to somebody who can move us forward in that way. So talked about all about what it is. So we talked about what disenfranchisement is. We talked about uh, the categories of disenfranchisement. We talked about the, the, um, the types of failures and we talked about how that impacts our grieving process. Okay, so that's real great. Now, what do I do with all of that? So I'm gonna give you some ideas of what to do with this for yourselves and for other people that you know may be disenfranchised and for the people around you. But I love this quote. Remember I talked about that, uh, that, that social support. Joy shared is joy doubled. Grief shared is grief halved. I'd love to say I came up with that. I have no idea who did, I looked it up. It sounds very fancy, but unfortunately, I'm not that smart. Um, but what, what a, an example of how grieving remaining private can feel so isolating. So one, <laughs> we, we think a lot about how we can help somebody, how we can empathize, what we can say, what we can do, but we don't always know that sitting in silence can be just as powerful. When someone is going through a storm, your silent presence is worth more than a million empty words. You don't necessarily have to say anything. You can be there, or you can ask other people to be there for you without even saying anything. Just be here and let me feel that you care about me. So um, I, I, I have this as a handout as well that I've provided to the Scleroderma Association along with a PDF of this presentation. And you are more than welcome to have access to that if you're interested. But one of the handouts is what to say to, to the bereaved and what not to say to the bereaved. And when you think about some things, when you're not really quite sure what to do, here are some ways or some things that you can think about. I'm so sorry for your loss. I wish I had the right words. Just know that I care. Instead of saying, I wish I had the right words, I just don't. <laughs> I wish I had the right words. This is how I feel, I can connect to you. I don't know how you feel, but I am here to help in any way that I can. Or you can say, I don't wanna assume how you feel, but I am here to help in any way I can. Your, you and your loved ones will be in my thoughts and prayers. My favorite memory of your loved one is, the favorite memory I had of some of the things that we've done before are, um, I'm always just a phone call away, maybe just giving a hug if that's appropriate, instead of saying something. Um, you could say, we all need help at times like this, and I'm here for you. And I am usually up early or late if you need anything. I'm not usually up early or late, but I will be up early or late if you have to reach out and you need that support. So I'll put that out there. And if you need to call me, I will be there. Um, don't say anything. Just be with the person like we were just talking about. I know it's hard to be strong right now. I have, I, and I know, that, hmm, I have feelings about that word strong because I think strong comes in a lot of different ways. Um, some people take it on that strong means I'm just going to barrel my way through it. And I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to let people know that I'm upset or I'm not going to acknowledge to myself that I'm having a hard time. Some people see that as strong. Other people may see strong as I'm moving through this the best that I can and I'm navigating this the best that I can and that takes a lot of strength but that also gives me permission to be able to express myself when I'm not feeling so quote unquote strong. Um, there was no good reason for this to happen because you'll hear people say you know, one day you'll understand that there was a reason for this. There's a reason for everything. It doesn't necessarily feel like there's a reason for everything. And it's okay to feel this way in whatever way that is. So what are maybe some not so helpful things to say? At least she lived a long life. Many people die young. He's in a better place. No, a better place would be here. That's where I would like him to be. She brought this on herself. Now I'm not making these up. <laughs> she brought this on herself. Don't blame yourself. She did this, not helpful. There's a reason for everything. That might be something that is a belief system that you have. And that can be a very, very powerful way of trying to make meaning from what you've gone through to try to find a reason 
to find some kind of way of identifying and shifting your identity as a result of the losses that you are experiencing. And so I may say, you know what, I know for me, I may not know what it is, but at some point I'm going to look back and realize there was a reason that this happened. But it's not my place to say to you, <laughs> maybe you should consider why this happened. That's your belief system. Um, aren't you over him yet? He's been dead a while now. You're young, you can still have another child. That happened to me when I was in, um, when I was married uh, to my first husband, I had miscarried. And the doctor came in to that office and looked at me and said, you know, one in three um, uh, pregnancies end up in a miscarriage. You're young, you're still gonna be able to have another child and literally turned around and walked out the door. Now I was 27 years old at the time. And I did not know about this in franchise grief. And had that happened now, I would have followed his rear end right out the door and had plenty to say about how that was handled. So in that, I think there was this thing of like, hey, don't worry, you'll be all right. You'll still be able to go through the. I wanted this child. I did not, that's not what I'm talking about here. And so we definitely get that. She was such a good person. God wanted her to be with him. I know how you feel. I also had a loss. You do not know how they feel. There's way too many things that make every single loss and every single person different. And so in that, saying I know how you feel in an attempt to express empathy, there's other ways of doing that that truly do indicate, hey, I can relate to those feelings. I know what it feels like to be sad. I know what it feels like to feel angry or hurt or worried or scared, you know, without saying, I know how you feel because that, that can take that away. She did what she came here to do and it was her time to go or be strong. It's good she's no longer suffering. Of course, we don't want people to suffer. Of course we don't. But to say it's better that she's passed because she's not suffering is a very painful thing to hear. Now she is at peace. Maybe if you started dating again, I know it's tough, but he wouldn't want you to suffer like this. You have to remember the good times. Those are what matter. Again, some of these come from a good place, but they're not helpful. They shut people down. And I talk with my clients about this stuff. I've experienced it myself. And I bet out of all of you guys who are here with me sharing this hour, um, I bet you can recognize some of these that have happened. And I wonder how you feel about that. <laughs> and I'm not your therapist, but I'm going to ask you, how do you feel about that, right? So in other ways of improving uh, and reducing the disenfranchisement is learning how to respond a little bit more effectively. So consider your own messages. What are you sharing with other people? What are you projecting to other people that they may be responding to that's disenfranchising yourself. So things like, oh, I'm fine. I, I didn't really need to worry about that. Or I knew that was coming. Well, then another person may not recognize that actually you actually are in pain. So are you even in tune with your own grieving process enough to be able to um, allow another person to step up and be that social support? Um, considering your own grief responses as well. What if you're, we're talking here about um, identifying whether or not we're disenfranchising another individual. Well, think about how your grief looks. Are you making assumptions that another person is grieving wrong if, they're, if you're not recognizing those responses because you don't have them? Teaching other people about disenfranchisement. This is um, a huge one. One of the reasons why uh, when we talk about communication, it's not only can we identify dis, uh, disenfranchisement, but how can we share with other people, you know, what you're saying right now isn't helpful to me. That makes me want to shut down. But you know what could be helpful is if you would just say maybe this. So instead of just saying, don't say this, or what you're saying is, is ridiculous and it's not supporting me, teaching other people how they can be supportive will, again, continue to expand our ability to be there for one another. Uh, practicing ways to respond. I do this with people quite a bit. Um, you know, I, I've had parents who have lost children and, you know, what do you do when somebody says, how many children do you have? Oh, I, I have three. Oh, what do they do? Well, I have two, but 
one's no longer with me. And that opens up a whole other line of communication, a whole other uh, uh, can of worms that peer, perhaps people don't want to go through. And so practicing what you're going to say and how you're going to say it can be very powerful in reducing anxiety. Learning assertive communication. Um, and again, this is communicating something to somebody in a non-aggressive way. Um, so being able to say uh, that you hurt me when you hurt me um, at that time uh, can be very powerful way of reducing our own disenfranchisement. And if you work with other people, helping reducing stigma of the grieving process in the workplace, or if you're in organizations and being able to spread this to other people, I promise you it makes a difference. Supporting hope and resilience. Now, I don't mean rose-colored glasses, everything's going to be fine kind of hope. I mean being able to identify when someone is being resilient. You know, I know that you have been working so hard to try to get through the work days that you have, and that takes a lot of energy. And I want to let you know that I recognize that. And yes, that might be resilient. And also in resilience, you can feel like you can't do it anymore. So I'm recognizing it and, and expressing that there are things in life that perhaps can bring joy. I don't want to say it to override their feelings, but I do want to recognize it and support it. Envisioning possibilities and identifying the steps by which to get there. So maybe you have to reestablish goals that you have in your life. Maybe those goals that you're grieving are no longer there for you. Okay, well then what are some other goals that you can achieve or that you can work towards and how are you going to do that? Drawing on strengths such as creativity, a sense of humor, social support, a sense of spirituality, um, a sense of uh, self-esteem, drawing on those strengths. And then also being able to learn from mistakes. Uh, finding inspiration in other people. I think one of the things I love um, and I always have, and I've been uh, aware of the scleroderma association. I've worked with people with, uh, with scleroderma. One of the things I love about this association is how supportive the association is of one another and how it creates community and how people find inspiration from one another. So I'm just, again, so thankful that you guys have found um, each other. Reaching out to the world around you. Do I understand that grieving can be a very quiet place, but being able also to remember you still need to engage in life. You that that is important, and being receptive to offerings, offerings of support. You know, instead of saying no, no, I got it, I got it, and and thinking that that's being strong, allow people and to receive, uh, allow people to give you and to be able to receive that. So, good timing, question and answer period. <laughs> uh, so, I'll go into the chat. Is that where I'm going here? Look yeah, if you want to open the chat. I sure will. How do you manage? Okay. Oh, I don't think that that's. Oh, you need to scroll oh that's, that's for the person behind before oh. me. Okay. You might scroll down to the bottom and then scroll up. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'll do. Okay. How can we contact you to answer questions? Oh, no, sorry, that's the other person too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these are all, okay, <laughs> 229. I should have looked at the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, saying, did the speaker start? Okay, this is an eye opener. Wow, I hear you and thank you. Oh, I thank you for saying that. This should be taught in high school to everyone. I could not, agree. I was just having that conversation with somebody. Um, it's really weird. I'm looking on the right-hand side of the screen. If you're wondering what I'm doing, that's where everybody is right now. Um, but no, I could not agree anymore. Um, do you want me to stop sharing the screen now? And then I can yeah. answer the question. I'll, you. Okay. I'll, you know what, I'll that's go- That's easier off. for you, you can. <laughs> I'm gonna go off of this slide just because um, I did wanna let everybody see that one. That is the happiest dog I've ever seen in whatever way that means to you, though. You know, no expectation that you have to do it like another person. 
and that's my contact information. So I'll just leave that for a second in case anybody wants to get a hold of me. Um, but yes, I do um, agree that this needs to be taught very early on. Here's the problem. We're in a, a, a denial culture. We stick our heads in the sand about so much. And so as a result of that, things that are very truly um, uh, just life basic, things that every single person is going to come in contact with when it's painful and associated with grief, we stick our head in the sand. Right now with COVID, people have had to face this way more um, than in my lifetime anyway. And so in that, we have got people that are having to go, okay, wait a minute, we're grieving. And what does that mean for us on a societal level? So um, I, I, I think what happens is when people grow up in our culture and they're not learning about grief and then they become educators, then they're not teaching about it because they weren't educated about it in the first place and it's a vicious cycle. Um, somebody says, I believe even younger, we have a plan in place in my district, but as an example, I made a referral for a social worker for a student in elementary last fall and someone actually showed up at the home Thursday, but only focused on why the child was not participating in school virtually. The only contact the child had was staff and me and just focusing on the child's goals. The one time, okay, the one, time looking for the question here the one time he participated in class he was silent and did not want to participate again since march one time he has connected with peers the fact that the family member had passed away in their home in front of the members and did not get an emergency help in time to save the person i don't have difficulties connecting with a child and family the father is wonderful and goes out of his way to ensure his son connects with me each school day the same cannot be said by my regular education staff. The frustration with the school increased the anxiety and, and also his expectation that any help by the school. I, I could I hear exactly what you're saying there. Um, we just don't have the, the support systems. I just, um, the Center for Grief and Trauma Therapy just received a grant from the Department of Education um, to specifically work with traumatized and uh, um, other youth who are um, experiencing uh, toxic stress, such as grief. And so they're, they only gave this, uh, this um, grant to five different states, five out of all of our states. So I'm hoping that we're going to be able to um, make it very clear that there's a need for that, that service. Um, the last ones, oh, good. I'm so glad you guys found this helpful. Oh, I'm so sorry for you losing your mom. That's a very difficult, difficult loss. Thank you. I keep, I'm looking, are there therapists that specialize in this area? Yes, there are. And I'm so glad that you asked that because many therapists will assume that they specialize in grief because they've worked with a lot of grieving clients. And that's just not the case. Um, this is a specialty just as if I were working with eating disorders or drug and alcohol. That's outside of my area of clinical competency. Can you find a therapist who walks next to you in the grieving process? Absolutely. But if you have somebody who says to you the five stages of grief, they do not have an understanding of really the complexity of grief. Now, when we get to somebody with prolonged grief disorder who has not been able to move out of that kind of acute grieving place, find a specialist in grief. That's something you really do need extensive training in and there are um, specific protocols and specific interventions that require uh, somebody to be skilled and supervised in that as they become more and more adept at that. Um, oh, thank you. Yes, you can certainly get a copy of the talk. Um, I'm, I'm just looking through for questions. I mean, the comments are just so lovely. And it, it, see, this is the meat, the way that I make meaning for my own loss is being able to, to share this kind of stuff with you. And I appreciate that feedback. Uh, so culturally, how they deal with death, the house would have been burnt down and the house displaced. So the fact that there's, oh, okay. Do you have any uh, tips for grieving your former healthy self? I, and that's a, real, that's a fantastic question. I think what we need to do is acknowledge what we've lost. And to be able to express all of the emotions and all of those indicators we were talking about that are saying, this is a loss. Give yourself permission to be able to say, this is grievable. You know, look at those things that you have lost. Ask yourself what that meant to you in your life. How has this impacted my life? Not only that loss, but all the implications of that loss as well. And when we're able to identify it, eventually over time, the reality of that loss, both emotionally and also intellectually, the emotions of that loss, be, and those become 
accepted. That doesn't mean you're saying, oh, that's okay, that happened. It just means, uh, not just, but it means, um, yeah, that happened. And I have to believe now that that's not coming back, or I've accepted the fact that I've lost that person, or I won't be going back to work. That's the reality. Okay, now how do I adapt to that? The way that you grieve could be very different than the way other people grieve, but I am going to say this, grieve, and then oscillate. And what I mean by that is give yourself permission. Imagine over here is grief, all right? Imagine over here is life and the things we have to do. Here is where you lean into your grief, where you give yourself that permission to explore it, understand it, and talk with other people about it. Who, but with things with, with, um, on topics that maybe not everybody else can hear. So find those people and allow yourself to go there, but don't stay there. Oscillate, move over to here. You have to get up. The kids have to eat. You need to get some sleep. You need to be able to open the mail and pay the bills. That's life. You have, we have to deal with that. So our job is to find a way to go back and forth. And we have found, research has found that that's one of the best ways to cope with grief. So not only how to grieve, but also how to cope with grief is to oscillate. And usually at the beginning of a loss, we hang out over here where we're engaged with our grieving process. And over time, hopefully we spend more time over here in dealing with the implications and adjusting to all of the changes in our lives. I hope that's helpful. Um, I'm just reading, looking for those questions. Um, do you, rec oh no, what happened? Uh, do you recommend EMDR for those experienced traumatic death of a spouse, which is complicating grief? Yes. I actually am doing EMDR right now for myself, for some trauma I've experienced in my life. And I am so thrilled. Not everybody responds to it, um, but certainly uh, that is a trauma focused uh, type of intervention with a lot of science behind it. So I am a huge fan of EMDR um, for any kind of, of trauma, certainly. Uh, let's see. Mm. Some readings, um, depending on the topic. Uh, for example, if you've lost a loved one, one of the books that I like is How to Go on Living When Someone You Love Dies by Therese Rando. I don't know if, am I allowed to say that stuff? Like, am I allowed to say book? Okay. <laughs> also, some people aren't such a fan, um, but how to go on living when someone you live, uh, when someone you love dies. So that's, that's one of my more, um, uh, my go-tos. It's an older book. You can find it on Amazon. It's relatively inexpensive, but depending on the loss, my encouragement would be to do some research online using uh, organizations that have some uh, good, robust support to it. So, um, you know, for example, the um, uh, uh, Grief Talk is one, uh, Grief Share is another one. I believe on my website, I have a list of, a, of, of some helpful resources as well, uh, which is right there. Um, there you go. And yeah, Death Cafe movement is helpful. I wish I had more time to talk. I would go through. Um, I think it can be hard to have hope and plan for the future with a devastating diagnosis. Absolutely. Do you have any thoughts about processing this? We can grieve those futures that we don't know if we're going to have. That ambiguous, so that's called an ambiguous loss or a non-finite loss. And part of navigating that grieving process is learning how to figure out how to live with the ambiguity and finding a place for that ambiguity to reside inside of ourselves and not getting too caught up into it indefinitely and finding ways to be present focused. I'm not saying disenfranchisement, I'm not saying ignore it, but I am saying find ways to be present and also acknowledge the fact that you're scared or acknowledge the fact that you're angry that your, your future has So changed. sooner, she, she asked if we could do 130. I'm sorry? She, no, thought no. We, she thought we were meeting at one. And I went, no. And then I said, is that what you need? Mm -hmm. um, 
a meeting or at 1 30. I, I, I think you're unmuted. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, it happens. <laughs> um, Can you say I, the I'm name of sure that book one more time? How to Go on Living When Someone You Lo Love Dies by Therese Rando, R A N D O. I just okay. love the book. It, it it's it's really comprehensive and it has separate chapters also um, for different kinds of losses to identify the unique nature of some of these losses, such as dying by suicide. Um, the, the Edge of Sorrow is another really good one by Francis Weller, good call. Um, what do people say when, why, what do I say when people ask if I'm an only child, my brother died, died by suicide? Oh, Janice, we would sit down and talk about that, you know, certainly. I would wanna know a little bit more about how, uh, how expressive do you wanna be? How vulnerable do you want to be when somebody asks you that question? When people ask me, how many siblings do you have? I say two. Um, and they say, oh, you know, whether their names and I, I'm at a place, you know, he died in 99. I'm at a place right now because drug overdose is not like, oh, okay, you know. So um, I'm at a place now where I'm able to say, you know, I lost my brother, you know, to a drug overdose. And I've gotten to a place where I'm like, that's not my problem. If that person has a problem with that, that's that person's problem. But that did not happen right away. That took me years to get to a place where I got through that stigma. So I think you have to ask yourself, what are you willing to share? What do you want to share? Do you want to share? Well, my brother has passed and not share how. And if somebody says, well, how did he pass? You know, thank you for asking, but I'd rather not talk about that right now. So it just depends on how you want to be able to express that. Um, with the progression of scleroderma being able to survive the end of the school year and have students see evidence of not being able to stop it, scary for my students, are there any resource for helping those who are experiencing this? Um, I am not 100% sure that I'm understanding where the question is, can you write that maybe in a different way? Sorry, I can be hard headed and my brain gets a little fried when I present. Um, so uh, are we out of time? It's, it's, yeah, uh, we're about out of time. It's, okay. it's about time for us to go to a lunch break. I just want to say thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this again. And if you want to get a hold of me, you can email me. Um, we do offer like telehealth times, not that I'm promoting us, I'm just saying, you know, we do have people that provide services and uh, and do that via telehealth if you guys need us but that's not why i'm here today i'm, I'm here to provide uh, this knowledge well thank you so much for that that was fantastic we really really appreciate you spending part of your saturday with us i'm more and than happy to do it i'm loving all the comments that say wow I, I didn't know how much i needed this because that's exactly how i felt the first time i saw your presentation at the national conference and that's why you were who i thought of to bring in today I was honored that you you yeah uh, that you uh, thought of me and it makes me feel um like I'm able to do something with my own grief. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you guys. You.